So that was a very gentle example. Although, if any of my students are out there, you know that when I talk about this piece in class, I mention how stressful it really is. There's a tremendous amount of tension in this piece, but it's subtle. It's all at the expense of absolute beauty on the surface. The next piece on the program is the Italian concerto, but only the first movement. This is from 1735. Now, the reason I throw in a concerto is because this is also a type of cyclic form. It's based on the, at least in Bach's case, it's based on the concept of the ritornello. The ritornello is a term that originates really with a couple of composers dating back to the 17th century, uh, specifically Vivaldi and uh, the Venetian Vivaldi and the Roman Corelli, who basically founded this form, developed it, and Bach learned from their example to incorporate the Italian style into his own Germanic style. And so we get this example, which is of course a piece of music written by a German composer, Bach, but in the style of the Italians. Therefore, it's called the Italian concerto. Now, the Ritornello principle is very simple on paper, although I don't challenge any of us to write one. So the principle goes as follows. There is an opening statement made by the ensemble. Most concertos, the principle of a concerto is a competition or an agreement. It depends on which root language you look into, whether it be the Italian or the Latin. But either way, a concerto signifies groups in agreement or and in opposition with one another. And think about if you go to the, uh, if you go just across the way here uh, to other places, other venues within Lincoln Center, and you can hear soloists performing with orchestras. That is, of course, a concerto. In the 19th century sense, it's often a competition, although not always. Um, so in this case, Bach begins with a statement of music that will keep returning, like a ritornello, throughout the course of the movement. And this is, in essence, what the orchestra, the larger ensemble, is meant to be playing. Then, in alternation with that orchestral statement, will be one by the soloist. In this case, it's meant to be probably a solo violin, one of the instruments par excellence in the Baroque era. So let me play for you this ritornello theme that's played by the larger ensemble. But of course, the beauty of this piece, the achievement of it, is that Bach is able to turn all of this into for a solo instrument. So here's the ritornello played by the orchestra.
first movement, 17.
Bach's music with these two examples. Um, of course, there are thousands, but we'd have to be here far longer to play all of those. Is that it's extremely life affirming music. It's very joyous, it's very buoyant. And this is important to know because Bach was someone who suffered tremendous tragedy in his own life. By the time he was 10, he was an orphan. Of the 20 children that he had, only nine survived into adulthood. His first wife died of complications from her seventh pregnancy while he was away. He came back, not knowing what had happened, and discovered that not only had his wife died while he was away, this is his first wife, Maria Barbara, but she had died and been buried. And he came back to discover this, and suddenly he was a widower with seven children. A year later, he, he married Anna Magdalena, and the rest, so to speak, is history. Thirteen more children with her. Now, the contrast between his personal biography and the life-affirming joyousness that you have in his music is really quite remarkable. Not every composer was able to do this. Many composers were able to incorporate their own biographies and psychologies into their music. There was no contrast. The music was the person. But what saved Bach ultimately was his devout Lutheranism. And this is probably where, if we had more time, I could tell you about the dominant and the tonic in relation to religious perspectives. But that's a whole other lecture. I want to move on and tell you about another composer, Domenico Scarlatti. That's the next piece in our program. This is the Sonata K380 in E major. And uh, again, for any of my students out there, you know that I teach this piece quite a bit as well. One of my favorite works. Domenico Scarlatti was born, just like Bach, Johann Sebastian Bach. There were many Bachs, actually. Johann Sebastian Bach in 1685, and they both died in the 1750s. Bach died in 1750, Scarlatti died in 1757. But what is so interesting about Scarlatti's biography, as opposed to Bach's, is that Scarlatti, for about 38 years of his life, the last 38 years of his life, he spent living on the Iberian Peninsula. First, he was working for uh, Princess Maria Magdalena Barbara in Lisbon, and then when she married uh, and ultimately became the Queen of Spain and moved to Madrid in 1733, he went with her and he was working for her and for her, of course, the royal family for the, almost the last 40 years of his life. Why is that relevant? Because Scarlatti was exposed to many elements that our traditional European composers, such as Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, were not necessarily exposed to, meaning flamenco, just as a quick example. And you're going to hear this in this sonata. Remember what I said about the Bach concerto, or just going back one piece, that Bach was imitating the large ensemble and the solo violin. And perhaps you were imagining these forces in competition with one another as you were listening to that piece. What about in this, in this sonata, written for the harpsichord? Not the modern piano, but the harpsichord, which is an instrument, for those of you who may not know what that is, a keyboard instrument with no possibilities of loud and soft, rather one dynamic level. So what you end up doing if you want to really perform these sonatas in the way they may have been performed back in the 1740s when he wrote them, and Scarlatti, by the way, wrote 555 of them, is you need to understand what he's imitating. For example, what does this sound like to you? Which instrument? Just that little fanfare. Trumpets, right? And that's exactly what he was, well, exactly, probably exactly, perhaps, <laughs> imitating. Now what about this passage? Pieces written before the modern 
the piano was really invented as we know it today. This is a product of the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century. This, if you can see inside of it, that's steel. None of that was around when Bach and Scarlatti were composing their music. So this piece of music is also a type of cycle, but I don't want to digress too much and tell you all about it. I just want to tell you this. Scarlatti was remarkably adept at taking one idea and transforming it into a sustaining entity that would work throughout the entire piece of music. You know, there was another composer who was pretty good at that. single motive. So we're going to call this a 